Welcome to the CBS Radio Mystery Theater Archives, the only YouTube channel which has the original classic episodes of the CBS Radio Mystery Theater in order with no ads. Thank you for listening, and now, enjoy the show. were popular in the 19th century, and everyone knows the names of the famous ones. Jane Austen, Louisa May Alcott, the Bronte sisters, George Eliot, but less well-remembered ladies also turned out popular romances, and some real chillers. One of these was Amelia B. Edwards, who gained fame as an Egyptologist. She was born in London in 1831 and came to the United States on a lecture tour toward the end of her life in the 1890s. Miss Edwards had a way with words, and her short stories are full of surprises and suspense. We're making a turn here to the right. Wait a minute. I used to play here as a child. The chalk pits are over there. Well, I, 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 I'm not sure, but well, I... be sure. I have a gun at your back. Now, where did you say you had hidden a body? Under that brush, over there. Show us. Go on, show us. Our mystery drama, The 415 Express, was adapted especially for the Mystery Theater by Elizabeth Pennell and stars William Prince. I'll be back shortly with Act One. The year is 1856, month of December. William Langford has been away from his native England for about six months on a business trip, which took him to Russia. He is happy to be back in London and is eager to see his friends, the Jelfs, who have invited him to spend the holidays at their luxurious manor house in Clayborough. His host, Jonathan Jelf, is president of the railroad company on which he is traveling. And William Langford better hurry because he's about to miss the 415 Express. All aboard! Wait for me! Step lively, sir! Uh, here, let me take your bag. I say, that was a close call. <laughs> May I see your ticket? Oh, I, I had it here somehow. Uh, just a minute. It's in an envelope. Oh, uh, well, don't you know the number of your car? I, uh, I was in such a hurry that... Ah, oh, there you are. Uh, I see. <laughs> Why didn't you say so, sir? Say what? Well, you're the gentleman I was told to look out for. Well, have I done something wrong? Oh, no, sir. I'm the one at fault. I should have known. You're a very special passenger. How so? Well, you're the guest of Mr. Jelf. And he's arranged for you to have the compartment reserved for company officials. <laughs> down a long corridor to a gloomy but shabbily elegant compartment which had a musty smell combined with stale tobacco. It seemed so remote from the rest of the train that I was surprised when he said, As I go out, I just lock the door so you can be completely alone. What if... Oh, don't worry, sir. You can open the door from the inside, but no one can come in. fog was settling in. When the key turned in the lock, I thought, oh, of course, the conductor was back again. Confound this door! What's the matter with it? A tall, fair man came in. Without glancing at me, he put down a box and removed a coat of dark green plaid. As he placed his umbrella and hat in an overhead rack, I recognized him. 
Good evening. No, uh, sir. I believe you are Mr. John Dwehurst? Uh, yes, th that is my name. Yes, I had the pleasure of meeting you at Dumbleton Manor in Clayburg about three years ago. Oh, yes, of course I knew your face, but your name, I regret to say. Langford, William Langford. <laughs> I've known Jonathan Jowl since we were boys together at Eton. Oh, then you also know my cousin Amanda. Mrs. Jelf, of course. So I presume we both have the same destination. Well, not if you're on your way to Dumbleton Manor. No, I'm, uh, I'm traveling on business. Oh, I recall that you are an official of the railroad company. Oh, it's true, true, and uh, I, uh, I have a rather troublesome mission. I suppose you are embarked on a pleasant holiday. Oh, yes, indeed. I look forward to this visit as the brightest three weeks in all the year. Well, the Jeffs have a pleasant house. They invited me to spend Christmas week with them. Are you coming? Oh, I can't be sure. It depends on how my uh, business uh, turns out. Uh, surely you could spare time for the holidays. Ah, but perhaps you haven't heard that we are constructing a branch line from Blackwater to Stockbridge. Uh, I've been away. Is it this new branch was my own idea? I'm not only a director of the railroad, but I'm one of the chief uh, stockholders. And as a lawyer, I'm also the company's solicitor. The train was making a racket, but Mr. Dwerhouse never stopped talking. He went into such detail about the problems of building a new railroad line that I lost interest. And I was scarcely listening until he raised his voice to say, 75,000 pounds cash down. That's a big sum. Oh, that's only a fraction of what the final price will be. But it is a great deal of money to be carrying here in one's breast pocket. You mean to tell me you're actually carrying 75,000 pounds with you? In cash? Oh, my dear sir, you've not been listening to me. The money must be delivered at half past six this evening in Mullingford for the deed of sale to the first piece of property. I don't believe Mullingford is a stop on this line. Ah, yes, well, I'll get off at Blackwater and find some sort of conveyance. I suppose Jelf will have someone at the Clayburg station to meet you. Oh, that's right. Uh, may I take the Jelfs any message from you? Oh, uh, oh yeah, yes, if you please, Mr. Bankford, that I will come over if possible for Christmas. Mm -hmm. uh, anything else? Well, you might... I tell my cousin Amanda that she need not burn down the hall in my honor this time, and I'll be obliged if you'll see that the chimney in the blue room has been cleaned before I arrive. Sounds ominous. <laughs> what in the world happened? Well, the last time I was there, that fireplace hadn't been used for months. The rooks had built a nest in the flue. So when I did a match, the chimney caught fire. Oh, it was a terrible mess. <laughs> Coming into a station. Blackwater! This stop is Blackwater! Oh, yes, and here's where I get off. Oh, I mustn't forget my deed box or all my old Burberry. Uh, thank you for your company, Mr. Langford. I wish you a good evening. I put out my hand, but it, he seemed too occupied to take it. As I watched from the window, he hurried off in a northerly direction. Then, moving around the compartment, I stepped on something. It was a fine Morocco leather cigar case with a silver monogram, J.D., on the side. I dashed to the top of the train steps and in the distance caught a glimpse of Mr. Dwerhouse talking to another man under a gaslight at the far end of the station. I jumped onto the platform and ran toward them. All aboard! I still had time because now Dwerhouse and his friend were directly in front of me when something unbelievable happened. The two figures vanished into thin air. The platform was deserted. And this time I had to make a leap for it. I would truly have missed my train. Oh, my good friend. Well, we're delighted to have you once again at Dumbleton. A great pleasure to be here, and believe me, it was quite the journey. <laughs> we want to hear all about your travel. I, I have some messages. Oh, I, I want to know about your parents and our old cronies. Um, and... But, but this is... Yeah, from... I have simply wonderful to see you again. Amanda, my dear, beautiful as ever. 
And I have a special message for you. Oh, well, later. You see, we're giving a party, and I want you to meet everybody before we go into dinner. Well, I'll have to change my clothes. No, you must hurry. Your bags have been taken up, and at the top of the stairs, someone will show you to your room. Oh, it, it wouldn't be the one with that fireplace, would it? Why, all the bedrooms have fireplaces. Uh, I mean, the blue room. Oh, well, I don't know what you're talking about. But never mind, just hurry. I can't keep my guests waiting any longer. Well, now you must tell us, how was the train ride? Oh, splendid. That 415 Express is very comfortable. Especially if you were a friend of the management. <laughs> we tried to take good care of our passengers. You certainly did. Even provided me with a fascinating traveling companion. Oh, I thought the conductor would see to it that you had a private compartment. Well, indeed he did. But I shared it, nevertheless. <laughs> That's strange. It certainly was. Well, who was it, Phil? Well, can't you guess? None other than your business partner and Amanda's cousin, Mr. John Dwarehouse, Esquire. <laughs> I've spilled my sherry on my dress. I, I must attend to it. There has been a, an extraordinary misunderstanding. Uh, Longford, come into the next room with me. Close that door. I don't understand. Good Lord, Langford, what sort of trick are you trying to play? I, I, I'm speechless. Now, we've been trying as hard as we could to keep this affair hushed up. I'm totally at a loss. The newspaper headlines have been bad enough. Our company's name is at stake. But I had hoped that the Fuhrer had died down. How could you do it, Langford? Now, remember, I have been away from England. I have been completely out of touch. Jonathan, you must come to the dining room with me. What are we going to tell our guests? Well, I will tell them that William Langford is a liar. I beg of you. What have I done? You have made up a vicious story. I did nothing but mention that I met your respected partner, Amanda's cousin, Mr. John Dwerhouse. Will you stop it? I swear to you that I met Mr. Dwerhouse on the train. What you said is impossible. It is the truth. If you'll just let me give you his message. You must listen, Jonathan. I've always known there has to be a reasonable explanation. If you saw my former business associate while you were in Poland or Russia, why didn't you telegraph me at once or get in touch with the authorities? Oh, why should I? After what has happened, it was your duty. Believe me, I know nothing of what you keep saying has happened. And furthermore, I did not see Mr. Drahaus in Russia or Poland. I met him this evening here in England, where I would expect him to be. On the railroad that you and he are so much a part of. Oh, Bill. How did he look? Oh, pale. Uh, older than I remembered. Uh, I suppose that's to be expected. But you will see for yourself. He is planning to be here to celebrate the holidays. Oh, why, that's wonderful. Well, now we can explain to our friends. My dear Amanda, this hoax may go deeper than I thought. I must ask Mr. Langford to stay in this room... Until we dispense with our guests. But if there is a reasonable explanation... I beg you to enlighten me. Simply because I saw Mr. Dwerhouse on the train. The last place in the world you would ever have seen John Dwerhouse is on today's 415 Express. Well, I should think that would be the most natural place for him to be. Must I shut it please, out? Oh, please, Jonathan, lower your voice. It's... It is public knowledge that three months ago... John Dwerhouse absconded with 75,000 pounds of the company's money. And he's not been heard of ever since. Now, that's an interesting turn of events. We have met Mr. John Dwerhouse on his way to complete a deed of sale three months after he has gone off with the money. Where has he been in the interim? And more importantly, where is he now? Remember, he disappeared on that station platform. I'm feeling sorry for William Langford, who was looking forward to a happy vacation at a country estate. And believe me, his troubles are far from over, as you will hear very shortly in Act Two. William Langford's holiday has certainly gotten off to a bad start. 
Instead of a pleasant visit with old friends, he finds himself accused of complicity in a crime which he knew nothing about. He had been served dinner alone in his room, where his feelings have been a mixture of anger at the treatment he is receiving, shock at what he has heard, and now a frenzy of eagerness to solve the mystery of his encounter on the 415 Express. I'm sorry we had to do this, Bill. We sent everybody home as soon as we could with any decency. Did you paint me as a villain or a madman? No, no, no. Amanda was quite right in saying I was too harsh. We believe now that an imposter made you the victim of a hoax. Or the whole thing was, on your part, a case of mistaken identity. No. I beg you to let me recreate the scene. Very well. We are willing to hear you out. Thank heaven. The conductor had settled me in the compartment and locked the door. But before long, the door was opened and a man came in. Describe him. Tall, thin-lipped, somewhat stoop-shouldered, light-colored eyes, gray hair, worn rather long. And, oh yes, he was wearing a dark green plaid coat, carried an umbrella and one of those metal boxes with a handle on top. I must say, he looked worried and tired. Well, who else could fit that description? Well, I'm not convinced. Go on. Well, I addressed him by name, and he responded at once, said my face looked familiar. The train was noisy, and Mr. Dwerhouse had far too much to say about the building of a new branch for the railroad line. I'm afraid I dozed. But I was brought up short when he said something about 75,000 pounds cash. A great deal of money he was carrying in his breast pocket. There. I knew you had heard about that 75,000 pounds. I heard it then, for the first time, and expressed astonishment that he should be carrying such a large sum. Where would he be going with the money at this late date? Why, he explained he had an appointment at half past six at the solicitors in Mullingford to deliver the money for the deed of sale. By heaven, if that happened last night... Some very strange things are going on. There's more. Now, I've heard enough. If what you say is true, I'll find out in Mullingford first thing tomorrow morning. I spent a restless night. Coming down to the dining room for an early breakfast, I found my host had already left for Mullingford. Amanda was full of apologies. You must understand how much this means to me. I can't believe my cousin would do anything wrong. If you really saw him... Wait a minute. I have a personal message for you. Mr. Dwerhouse said you were not to try burning down the house, or at least the hall, in his honor. What? He told me about the last time he was here, and, and the rooks in, in the blue room chimney. You did see him. You must have. And no one else would know about that. Bruce will surely convince Jonathan. I want desperately to believe you, Bill. But whoever you saw was not on his way to settle accounts. They haven't seen Dwerhouse in Mullingford or anyone else from our company. That was a most damaging false alarm. Perhaps this will convince you. John's cigar case. I've seen it a thousand times. Look here. His initials. Where did you get this case? Mr. Dwerhouse dropped it last night in the compartment on the 415 Express. Give it to me. I'm going to Blackwater to call a meeting of our board. Bill, I'm frightfully worried. And I'm feeling greatly relieved. Jonathan will turn up the answer now that he knows Mr. Dwerhouse is nearby. Oh, but is he? Tell me again. Now, where did you last see him? When he got off the train at Blackwater. Uh, uh, who else would have seen him get off the train? Why, of course, the conductor. He was standing on the platform just by the steps. Well, then have to ask him. We can take the early train to Blackwater. We promised Jonathan we wouldn't talk. Oh, well, we dare not mention any names. Won't you be recognized on the railroad? Oh, never. I always travel by carriage. <sighs> then let's go. Here 
comes the conductor. Is he the same one? Well, he is. Aye, uh, tickets, please. Why, good day, sir. Are you traveling back to London so soon? No, we're just on our way to Blackwater. Ah, if I had known, I would have given you and the lady the company compartment. Oh, not necessary for such a short trip. But tell me, do you remember the gentleman with whom I shared that compartment? Why, sir, there was no one with you. You were completely alone. You were standing on the platform when he got off at Blackwater. The only person who got off that car at Blackwater Station was yourself, sir. I was running after him. Well, you were in a hurry. But uh, we weren't there long. And I thought you were just out for a breath of air. Oh, excuse me. Blackwater! Blackwater! Here's where we get off. My cousin left another man. Yes, right over there under that station light. I ran toward them, and then... I, I, I can't explain what happened, but, but they... They vanished. Did you get a good look at the other man? An excellent view. I would recognize him anywhere. He must have been one of the railroad officials. Let's go to headquarters, and you can pick him out. I can't just barge in. We were in the lobby of the building. Their, their pictures are all on the wall. And you can show me who it was. There's the rogues' gallery. I, I, I don't see a likeness of Mr. Drehouse. Well, this is where his picture used to be. Now, look carefully at each face and tell me if you recognize anyone. No. No, no, absolutely not the slightest similarity. Bill, don't, don't let him see us. But look, we just came into the lobby. It's the conductor. Well, shouldn't he be on the train to London? I should think so. He's getting on the lift. Oh, let's follow him. Because we can't. They know me upstairs. If I went traipsing through this building, Jonathan would be furious. Well, may I help you? I want to see Mr. Jonathan Jelf. Uh, Mr. Jelf is attending a board meeting. Uh, but this is urgent. You may I ask your name and business? Uh, yes, I'm Benjamin Summers, conductor on the local branch. Yeah, well, Mr. Jelf is a very busy man. Perhaps someone else. I'll see no one but Mr. Jelf, and he'll thank me for it. This is a matter of extreme importance. Now, what is all this? You say your name is Conductor Summers? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, with the company for 14 years. All right, state your business. I'm not in the habit of being called out of board meetings. Well, I, I try to be so careful. But last night on the 415 Express... Well, come, tell me quickly, man. Something unusual happened on last night's run from London? Uh, I had instructions to show a gentleman to the company's private compartment. Yes, yes, and uh, did you recognize him? Uh, why, no, sir. But he had a special railway pass, and I'd been told to take care of him. What did he look like? Oh, nice appearing chap. About your build. I believe he was your friend. Until today. What are you suggesting? The man was back on the train today with a lady. And his behavior was so peculiar, I felt it my duty to... to... Well, well, go on, go on. Well, he asked me about another man in the private compartment. By all means, tell me about this other man. Uh, there was no one else, sir. I have the key, and I know the rules of the company. But at no time did you see anyone else with my friend. Oh, no, 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 sir. At Blackwater, he dashed off the train, waving something in his hand. He called out. But no one except the baggage man was there. The regular passengers had all gone to the other end of the station. Oh, he acted crazy-like. I see. Did you question him? Oh, I, I, I didn't think it my place. But today, I'm very suspicious. This is no time to speculate. Thank you, Summers. Oh, uh... Say nothing about this to anyone. I'll call you later for further questioning. Amanda, I thought I told you both to mind your own business. That's exactly what we've been doing. Then why did you come into town by train? Well, I wanted to exonerate myself in front of Amanda. You're in this together, are you? Oh, we're all in it, Jonathan. 
I'll do anything to prove my cousin's innocence. Like making up a scatterbrain story about a non-existent man? I'm searching for a witness to prove I saw Mr. Dwerhouse. Well, you're not doing very well. I've spoken to the conductor. Oh, and what did he tell you? He said that Bill was traveling alone. At no time on the journey was anyone else in that compartment. It's not true. I have no more reason to doubt Summer's word than to doubt yours. But Jonathan is obviously trying to reach us. Well, I must have proof. Well, what's that on your desk? Oh, oh yes, the cigar case. You cannot doubt it belongs to Mr. Dwellhouse. Well, didn't you show it to your board of directors? Yes, I did. And I must admit they recognized the case at once. His brand of Havana cigars and... His initials. Now, Bill, tell me honestly, where did you find this? You know the whole story. Did you see him take out a cigar? No. The case must have fallen from his coat pocket when he was leaving the compartment. And then what? I picked it up off the floor and ran after him. And you claim this happened at the Blackwater Station, hmm? It did. Mr. Dwerhouse was met by another man on the north end of the platform, and I ran after them. But Conductor Savasas told me there were no other passengers at that end of the platform. But I saw Then them. why didn't you return the cigar case? Because... Be, oh, this is the part I can't explain. Suddenly, they disappeared. Ah, and that's exactly where your story doesn't hold water. But I can describe both men. The details are etched deeply in my mind's eye. Bill, if you can find either one of them, I'll begin to believe your story. I wish I knew more about Mr. Dwerhouse's first disappearance. Jonathan, we must trust him. Until there is tangible proof. <sighs> Would you promise not to mention Dwerhouse's name to anyone but the two of us? I promise. <laughs> Miss Kelly, please tell Mr. Ricks to remove the confidential X2 file from the safe and bring it to me at once. Uh, you called for these, Mr. Jill? Oh, Ricks, you took your time about bringing them. But I, I just wanted to be sure that the, the files were complete, sir. Well, well don't, don't leave the material on that table. Bring it over here. I want everything connected with this case. Great Scott. Amanda, look at him. Uh, Mr. Jelf said I've been working late every night, and if you don't mind, I would like to leave somewhat early this evening. Don't let him go. What's the matter with you, Langford? Who is this man? Oh, why, I beg your pardon. Meet my trusted bookkeeper, Augustus Rex. He's the one. What do you mean, the one? The one what? The man who met Mr... That is, I'm positive... He's the man I saw at the station. A witness at last in our search for John Dwerhouse? Perhaps. But if a trusted bookkeeper met him at the station, why did he keep it a secret when his employer is desperate to know the missing man's whereabouts? The bookkeeper's answers to vital questions may give us some clues, but... The mystery is far from over. There's much more to be told in Act Three. On the 415 Express from London, William Langford has had a baffling encounter with a man who is said to have absconded with 75,000 pounds in railroad funds. So far, Bill has been unable to prove that he actually saw the culprit. But now he believes he has found a witness. Augustus Rakes, bookkeeper, short, sandy-haired, with a mustache, even wearing the same tight-fitting scotch tweeds he wore on the day Langford saw him on the railroad platform. The two of them have just come face-to-face -face in the office of Jonathan Jelf, president of the railroad company. What a relief to see you again, Mr... The name is Rakes? Uh, uh, yes, sir, but to my knowledge, uh, we have never met. It's true. But I saw you several nights ago at the Blackwater Station. Oh, uh, no, not me, sir. You've mistaken me for someone else. But I tell you, I am positive. Now, just a minute. Let's take this one step at a time. Mr. Ricks, where were you at 6 o'clock on the evening of December 23rd? Why, uh, I, I was right here in the office working for you, don't you remember? You were reviewing the Bradley case. Ah, yes, yes, yes. Oh, but I left for Rome around 5. My wife and I were giving a dinner party. 
Where did you go at that time? Oh, nowhere. I, I stayed at my desk. But you took time off to go to the station. Well, I have not been near the station in months. I saw you there last week. Is that true, Rex? I swear to you, sir, we've been so busy with year-end accounts. I worked every night last week late until at least eight o'clock. Can you prove it? Well, uh, Clerk Hunter worked with me. We were together the whole time. You can ask him. I will. Oh, I've rather lost my appetite for supper. And so have I. I'm sorry, Langford, but your story grows more incredible by the moment. Now, my staff is reliable, and Rakes is supported not only by the clerk, but by Miss Kelly and several others. He couldn't possibly have been where you said he was at that time. I've never trusted that man, Rakes. He's shifty-eyed. Amanda, he's been with me for 17 years, always hard-working and trustworthy. What's he doing over there? Driver, slow down the carriage. What are you talking about? Going into that pub. Your trusted bookkeeper, Augustus Rakes. And look who's with him. By George. It's that conductor, Summers. Oh, I will call that Rakes on the carpet again tomorrow. And I want to be there when you do. So, you see, Mr. Jill, this gentleman has mistaken me for someone else. Now, Mr. Rakes, you are certain that you have had no lapse of memory concerning your activities during the month of December. Well, I thought I'd proved it to you, sir. I swear I have not been away during office hours since I took my leave of absence. Very well. Take a look at this. Have you ever seen that before? What? Oh, it's a cigar case. <laughs> now, I, I do not smoke, Mr. Jill. I'm not suggesting it is yours. Please examine the initials. <gasps> Jonathan, let's get the truth from him at last. Mr. Rakes, did you or did you not meet Mr. John Dwerhouse at Blackwater Station? <laughs> I was away. 200 miles away in Devonshire. Ah, but you have gone to great pains to prove you were here in the office. No, no, no that was in September when I took my leave of absence. I was away for three weeks. And I'm innocent. I, I, I'll get it for you. Get what? The money. If you'll ask no questions, I'll return every shilling and pence. How much? 75,000 pounds. Oh, you took the money for the Mullingford property. I did. I did. But I know now it can do me no good. I will return it at once. At 60, 65, 70, 75,000. Well, it seems to be intact. Now, Mr. Rakes, where is John Dwerhouse? Uh, I have not seen him since last September. You talked to him on the 23rd of December. No. I wish I had, but I couldn't because... because that would have been totally impossible. Why? Because Mr. Dwerhouse is dead. Are you hinting at murder? No, no, not murder. What in the name of heaven, man? What happened to John Dwerhouse? I thought I'd only stunned him. You did. You not only stole the money, but you killed my cousin John. I, I didn't mean to. Just what did you mean to do? I wanted to slip away to America and start a new life. Oh, at company expense. Well, I knew about the money because I drew the draft from the London bank where Mr. Dwerhouse was to pick up the cash. All right, go on. I had been granted three weeks' leave for a holiday in Devonshire, but... I actually booked passage on the ship departing at midnight on the 4th of September. We want to hear every detail. I'll tell it to you just like it happened. When the 415 Express pulled into the Blackwater Station. Mr. Dwerhouse? Mr. Dwerhouse? Oh, yes, sir. You're Riggs, uh, Augustus Riggs, am I correct? Uh, yes, sir. I, I thought someone should meet you. Oh, that's very good of you. I'll uh, need some sort of conveyance to nothing for. Oh, well, if you don't mind walking, I know a shortcut through the fields. Well, I don't know. I'm a bit nervous carrying so much money with me. Oh, yes, yes, exactly, sir. I think it wise not to arouse any suspicion. Uh, suspicions about what? 
Well, you must know, sir, that certain infections in this area are opposed to the building of the new branch line. Oh, yes, of course, I know there are problems. I think it's best for you to arrive without being seen on the way to the solicitor's office. Ah, ah. Well, if you say so, I don't mind walking, but it does get dark so early and the fog is settling in. Oh, well, I know the way. Just follow me. <laughs> Weather. I really should have taken the carriage. And, uh, it's much quicker this way, sir, and I assure you, it's better for you to go unobserved. Oh, oh, I, uh, oh dear, I, I must have stumbled on a route. No, no, I'm, I'm all right. No, no, here, let me help you. No, you really do. Oh. You are a murderer. No, please, no. Manslaughter, perhaps, but... Not murder. What did you use for a weapon? A length of pipe which I had concealed under my coat. Then you did have intent to kill. No, no, no. Only to stun. I meant Mr. Dwehouse no harm. No harm, indeed. How did you expect to get away with this? Well, I expected to be accused of stealing, but by the time you discovered the money was missing, I'd be far out on the Atlantic Ocean. You are a cruel and callous man. Oh, no, I, I thought he was sleeping like... And I bent over to make sure he was as comfortable as possible. And then, then I felt for his pulse. I realized what I'd done. My poor, poor cousin. Now, Amanda, everything may still be all right. We know that Mr. Dwerhas did not die. Oh, I, I, I wish that were true. Of course it's true. I saw him less than a week ago. Where did you leave him? Oh, well, when I found he wasn't breathing, I, I dragged him to the chalk pit. Oh. I rolled him into the pit and covered the body with branches. I figured nature would do the rest. Don't doubt, Amanda. Sometimes nature is kind. We are going to find him. Oh, I beg you to be merciful. Oh, if only my cousin is found alive and well. I've given back the money. You were afraid to spend it. I will never forgive you for letting an innocent man take the blame. At last, Jonathan Jelf was on my side. We had to test the truth of Augustus Rake's story. I'll handle this my own way. Oh, Jonathan, let the police handle it. They'll be on call, but I want to see this for myself. I'm taking Gus Rakes to the chalk pit. I want to go with you. Absolutely not. You're staying here. But he's my cousin, and if... You'll know soon enough. Well, I'm going. Of course. The two of us will take Rakes in custody... And make him squirm over this preposterous story is concocted. It was eerie out there at night. We carried torches and the flickering shadows danced like demons. Rakes led the way to the chalk pit. We are, we're making a turn here to the right. Where did you say you hid the body? Uh, under that brush over there. All right, show us. Go on. I'll pull this brush aside and prove that the man is a liar. <laughs> there is a body. I, I, I told you, but I didn't mean to do it. He's covered with the same plaid coat he was wearing on the train. And the body has been here only a few days. I leave it to you to make positive identification. Uh-huh. Oh, oh merciful heaven. This cannot be. Watch out! Rick is attempting to make a run for it. Now's the time to summon the police. Hello! Hello out there! Arrest that man! He's dangerous! Don't let him get away! We have the coroner's report, and there's no question about it. John Dwerhouse died last September. I am completely bewildered. What would we have done had you not been visited by, by an apparition? I don't believe in apparitions. Everything about him was so real. No hint that my cousin was, was in any way ethereal. He did seem unnaturally pale. And when I put out my hand to say goodbye, I was surprised that he didn't take it. You see. And then, then of course, the way those two men vanished... What's your opinion, Jonathan? Well, I have only one explanation, which seems at all logical. I wish I could find some logic in this affair. You said that after you settled into the compartment, you felt sleepy. But I was tired. 
And the motion of the train did rather lull me. And later you dozed off. Well, Mr. Dwerhouse went into such detail. My and... friend, there was no Mr. Dwerhouse except in your dream. I only dream about things related to my own life. Mixed up ideas from out of the past. When you had met John Dwerhouse, he could have been on your mind. But I knew nothing about your railroad or the money. How do you account for my accurate description of Augustus Rakes? Well, no, I... I can't answer that. Although I suppose you may have heard me mention him. Never, to my knowledge. Well, all I can say is that dreams are strange and wonderful things. And I'm deeply grateful that you fell asleep on the 415 Express. <laughs> Mr. Langford. Uh, let me take your bag. Hello, Summers. <laughs> Just follow me, Mr. Langford. If I may be so bold, perhaps when you're settled, you'll give me your autograph. What are you talking about? Uh, I had no idea you were such a celebrity. <laughs> they say it was you alone who solved the mystery of poor Mr. Dwerhouse. Now, that's enough. No, no, wait a minute. Would you have recognized Mr. Dwerhouse? Oh, well, of course. He often traveled on this train, and we had many pleasant conversations. When was the last time you saw him? Uh, and, oh, and the 415 Express. Oh, that dreadful day in September when he was murdered. Where did he sit? As always, in the company's private compartment. And who has occupied it since then? Why, no one, until I unlock the door for you. That would account for my finding the cigar case. Sir? Uh, nothing. What are you doing? Uh, oh, uh, looking for my key to unlock the compartment. No, no. I'm traveling in the public section. But I thought a gentleman like you... Do as I say. Carry my bag to another car. Never again will I be locked up with a ghost. A ghost? A dream? Is it possible to remember something which was never placed in your memory? I'm reminded of that little man who wasn't there. You may recall, he wasn't there again today. And we all wished he'd go away. That always seemed to me like a more or less logical bit of reasoning. In any event, if you take a train, or today a plane ride, and talk to a stranger, even a friend, just be sure you have a witness. I'll be back shortly. This has been yet another example that truth is stranger than fiction. Much of the story we have just heard is true. There was a man named Augustus Rakes who committed such a crime. Judge and jury found him guilty of murder even though he claimed it was not premeditated. Rakes was hanged at the Old Bailey in the month of January, 1857. For many years, his effigy could be seen in the Chamber of Horrors at Madame Tussaud's famous wax museum in London. Our cast included William Prince, Anne Williams, Ian Martin, and Earl Hammond. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. I hope you enjoy this episode of CBS Radio Mystery Theater. 